I think you guys, almost everyone met me in the lab already. So uh, I am Peter So. Um, I'm a faculty in MIT. I'm from the mechanical engineering and also biological engineering department. And as you guys know, I can help you guys tune microscopes, which is what I do. I build microscopes. Um, so um, today I want to tell you everyone have built a microscope. You guys pretty much are done. And you guys have seen that your microscope, although it is actually relatively easy to build and relatively cheap, it works reasonably well. And you guys so see that you can image, for example, some of the dendrite of the neuron that, for example, Bill and Seth um, created um, for you guys and some of you guys grown. And one of the things that you notice is when you guys try to image the dendrite, the dendrite itself is very dim compared to the spheroid's body, right? The spheroid, hope most of you guys seen it because most of the system works, but the spheroid body tend to be very bright because it's very thick. On the other hand, the dendrite itself is very thin, so it's very dim. And so one of the things that you saw is you need to really saturate your camera such that you can see the dendrite, but at the same time, you, the rest of the spheroid is saturated. So it would be very good to develop a method such that you can actually do so-called optical sectioning, that you can image things plane by plane so that you can reject the background of the rest of the spheroid body and see the dendrite better. So today, I guess it's a one-two punch. It's me and Dipan. Oh, everyone knows Dipan too because he has been helping you guys for the last week and a half. And so I am going to tell you a few methods of doing 3D imaging based on very traditional method of confocal and multifotron and a little bit second harmonic generation. Um, you guys this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon would go into the lab and try some of those systems out. Or We'll show you how to push a few buttons to get it work. It's a, you're not going to build that. Uh, so, uh, so, this after, so I'm going to give you a little bit principle of the basic confocal and two-photon imaging. And then Dipan is going to tell you some of the modern, modern method of doing 3D imaging based on sheet light microscopy and different methods. OK. So today I want to tell you about 3D microscopy based on confocal, multifotron, and if I have time, I most likely not, um, tell you a little bit about second harmonic generation microscopy. Sometimes I'm a little bit optimistic. So as, as we are started thinking about three-dimensional imaging, one of the things that are very clear is biological systems are inherently three-dimensional. A lot of the work in my lab are in neurobiology area looking at neurons in the brain. So if you take a look at the brain, it is of course clearly a three-dimensional structure. Specifically, if you are, think you are studying the mouse brain like what we do, the brain is about a centimeter cube. So it's a big warning. I mean, if you think about a cell, it's a micron cube. So the trick about mapping structures in the brain is not an easy thing. So one of the things that are still not completely known is how the different regions of the brain are connected together. So today we have programs that are actually mapping every single cell in the brain and trying to look at the connectivity. So this is some of the areas people are so-called so connectomic today. So even if you go from a brain to a brain slice, you can also keep a slice of brain alive for quite a while and looking at the activity of the neuron in the brain slice. But in order to keep the neuron alive, the slice need to be on the other few hundred micron flick. And so it's still a difficult thing to image through them. How big is your spheroid, you think? Any guess? A micron? 100? Hmm? That's a probably a good estimate. I think some of the bigger ones, maybe a couple hundred micron. Um, so if you are thinking about a brain slice, it's actually quite thick. It's a little bit typically thicker than your spheroids. And then even if you are studying single cells, if you want to resource the structure within a cell itself, the, with submicron resolution, the cell itself is a three-dimensional structure. Before I go on to telling you a little bit about other 3D imaging techniques, I should say that in the medical field, 
the gold standard is histopathology. It is certainly a three-dimensional technique in the sense that if you have tissue, let's say you have a tumor in the lung, you can always take a chunk of the lung out, fix it, slice it up, and image it slice by slice by slice. And if you have enough patience and if you're cutting, up, cutting the tissue is not a problem, you can generate three-dimensional structures. That's so-called histo uh, serial histopathology. And it is not an easy thing to do because cutting generates a lot of artifacts and reconstruction of artifact prone slices are difficult. But still, you should know that this is in some way a very traditional uh, uh, gold standard in medical field on generating 3D images. But in terms of an optical guy like me, if I am thinking about true 3D imaging, I am thinking about methods that inherently give you three-dimensional resolutions. So one of the things to remember is your wide field microscope do not have three-dimensional resolution. If you remember what you guys did is you guys focused the light at the back aperture of the microscope. And if you remember Steve's lecture, if you focus the light at the back focal point, the light becomes collimated after the lens, after the objective, which means that your sample is uniformly excited at every depth. So you have no depth resolution in your microscope. So the trick is, can one develop method that is 3D resolved so that you can extract information on a plane-by-plane -plane basis? OK, so there are two today quite traditional methods. One of them is confocal microscopy. First developed, I'll go into a little bit more detail, first developed by Professor Minsky, also from MIT here. The second method is two-fold microscopy developed by two groups. I will mention that in also in a minute. First of all, Dr. Minsky. Dr. Minsky, anyone know uh, Melvin Minsky? Or heard of Professor Melvin Minsky? I guess you guys are not neurobiologists, and also you guys are not artificial intelligence guy. So he typically I call it the father of artificial intelligence. He's not, I mean, so the reason that he started thinking about doing three-dimensional imaging is because he wants to understand the connections in the brain. So he started thinking about, can I build a microscope to look in the brain such that I can look at connections? So that is in 1950s which is almost now 60 years ago. And he filed a pattern in 1961, developing the first confocal microscopy to, for 3D imaging of the brain. On the other hand, sometimes it is good to invent something, but sometimes inventions are a little bit before its time. In fact, if one look at the history of confocal microscopy, you will quickly find that after the invention of Dr. Minsky, it was quickly forgotten. And then actually, confocal microscopy did not become commercialized until 1980s. So one of the questions is why is Professor Minsky's invention didn't work? So actually, at that time, how many of you have used a confocal microscope before? Uh, quite a few, and certainly after today and tomorrow, most of you guys, maybe not everyone, would have a chance to use a confocal microscope. Today, a confocal microscope typically involves either one spot of light or multiple spot of light that move around a sample in 3D and generate an image. And you see the image not by your eye, but by a computer. Because if you generate image spot by spot, you need to have a computer for reconstruction. And one of the things that what Dr. Minsky did in 1960 is after he scanned the spots of light, he displayed the output in an oscilloscope. So as the thing scan, you kind of see a bit of light on the oscilloscope, kind of a trace that brings around. So when he showed it to a lot of the biologists, they was not that impressed. And in fact, Dr. Minsky himself at that time don't have the mean to generate a three-dimensional image from the data. There are 
computers in 1960s, of course, but even a computer that you have sitting on your desk is probably bigger than the room today here in the 1960s. So there are a number of technological reasons that the invention of Dr. Minsky uh, did not take off in 1960s. But the concept that he has is exactly the same as a confocal microscope today. So unfortunately, by the time of 1980 comes around, from what I understood, Dr. Minsky never make much money out of that invention because patents have only 20 years. So it's one thing to remember is if you are going to invent something, you better be lucky. If you are not, if you are so bright that you are 20, 30 years ahead of everybody, you probably won't make much money. <laughs> okay, so what does uh, Dr. Minsky say? Dr. Minsky say, if I have a light source, let's say a lamp, but today probably a laser, if I have a small pinhole on one side, I put a lens such that the light is focused at the specimen. Now, if I put an identical lens here, the light would focus at pretty much a uh, symmetric pace, right? Make sense so far? Now, what happens if I put a pinhole here so that only this ray of light, the black one, goes through, but if I have excitation along this so-called double inverted cone region, for example, the blue light and the red light would not focus at the pinhole, and because of that, it would be blocked at the so-called confocal pinhole. So the idea of a confocal microscope is to have a pair of so-called conjugate lenses that map a pond source into the specimen and then map the pond excitation to a pinhole. So that the excitation uh, that is not at the focal point of the specimen does not map through the final pinhole. That's the basic idea. Are we good so far? OK, so that's the idea of confocal microscopy. In some way, the idea is very simple. If you look through the history of some of the imaging and spectroscopy methods, actually a number of people think about that, but have not used it for imaging. So as I mentioned before, confocal microscopy Invented, was invented in 1960s, and then it was forgotten until a number of things comes around, including high sensitivity detectors, including um, uh, better scanning mechanisms, as, and most importantly, the development of computers. And around 1980s, a number of companies, specifically BioRed, some of you guys probably use some of their product for various things, worked it with a number of uh, people, including Dr. John White, who is now, at that time he was in England, but now he is in uh, Wisconsin, start to develop again a confocal microscope and trying to image biological specimens. So this is actually one of the earlier papers from, uh, from uh, John's group. And one of the things, actually today, you wouldn't think that is impressive. But on the other hand, at that time, this is, I believe, is, I think it's a sea urchin embryo looking at the microtubules. And one can see that this is a normal wide field imaging. So at that time, when they start showing the confocal image, they're showing detail that you can never seen before. People were tremendously excited. So, and by able to really presenting three-dimensional resolved image, John and BioRed and a lot number of early investigators of confocal microscopy started to see that to in some way started the field of three-dimensional biological imaging. So Today, there are many things that you could image with, uh, with this sort of system. Um, one of the things that confocal works very well are systems that are relatively uh, transparent and not too, too thick. So if you want to map the three-dimensional structure of a cell, or if you have cell in relatively clear matrix, confocal works quite well. In some cases, you can also push confocal a little bit and go into more turbid specimen. For example, today there is a company developing confocal microscope for the diagnosis of skin cancer called Lucid. 
uh, instruments. So this is some work that actually, I think some data that I took at some point, that you can actually use confocal microscope to look into the skin. Most of you guys probably doesn't think about how the skin structure looks like. Your skin are layered at structure. It has a epidermal layer, and then there is also a stromal layer. The epidermal layer is your epidermis, your stromal layer is your dermis. Your epidermis at the bottom of it is a basal cell layer that is the germative cell layer that the cell differentiate, migrate to the top, eventually falls off. That the skin is your protective layer of your body. In the dermis, most of the dermis is a matrix material, consists of collagen and elastin fiber with a sparse distribution of fibroblasts. So if you use a confocal microscope and image through it, for example, when you get to the dermal layer, you can actually see the, this is actually mostly, um, mostly melanin cap sitting on top of the basal cells. And you can see a little bit, not really that well, of the keratinocyte in the layers a little bit above it. So now, Using confocal for very deep imaging, as in this case, um, does it works okay, but not great. So this is some data from my friend, Dr. Barry Masters, using a confocal microscope to image the back of the eye, looking at the back of the optical nerve. The eye, unlike the skin, is much more transparent. As you can see, you can see pretty good images at the back of the eye of the optical nerve. And then you can actually see the nerve coming down. You may ask, your typical microscope objective is have only a fairly small working distance. How do you get to the back of the eyeball? So one of the trick about doing that imaging is the, if you look at your eye, your eye has a little lens also. And the lens of the eye can be used as your objective. And then you can use it to image the back of the eye. So that is how this image are done. Now, of course, if you are willing to sacrifice the eye of a rabbit, so this is human. So if you are willing to sacrifice the eye of a rabbit, you can also take a look at the lens of the rabbit. In this case, there's no problem because you take the lens out and then you image. So in this case, it's image with a normal objective. And you can actually see something that almost looks like cataracts. In the, lens of the, in the lens of the rabbit, so, and you can resolve this structure in three dimensions reasonably well. So this is the, this is the, um, the lens, and of course, you can also image the, um, this is the cornea of, uh, of the eye, and you can see that that you can actually, with just refracted light from the confocal microscopy, you can resolve different layers of the cornea. And as we come back down, you can also see almost the optical nerve that is going through, going through the cornea at that point. So one second, it's just the Im as the image pays through, you can see the individual nuclei there. This is so-called the Bowman membrane, which is uh, in, uh, the germative layers on the, uh, on, on the cornea of the eye. And as you go through, you can see that as oh, we will go through. We can't, I think I make the movie too long. Uh, so here's the optical nerve. <laughs> so anyway, so confocal is a pretty good technique, especially if you are looking at things that are semi-transparent. I will skip that because I think I would be running out of time. So I want to now start to transit into a second technique. So confocal, let me just to recap, is a very simple technique. The basic idea is to map a point source into one point in the specimen and looking at the signal from one point of the specimen mapped to a confocal pinhole. That's how you reject the light. So confocal microscope generate three-dimensional resolution based on rejecting signal that is our plane. So it's based on how you detect the signal. So the second technique that I want to tell you about is multi-photon, also typically called two-photon microscopy, is based on how you generate excitation. It, the idea is generate excitation using nonlinear optics. That's a basic idea. I think Steve tell you guys about fluorescence earlier, right? Did he? 
Did he say anything about Jablonski diagram? Or he don't have time to do that. He did, right? So if you talk, if you remember Jablonski diagram, then this is normal fluorescence excitation. The basic idea of fluorescence excitation is if you have a high energy photon, let's say a blue green or UV photon, that might excite an electron of a molecule from the ground state to an excited electronic state, the molecule will subsequently vibrational relax and then emit another photon to return to the ground state, which is typically at longer uh, wavelength, higher, uh, so less energy. You can actually generate the same excitation using two photons at the same time by using an intense infrared laser. So two photon microscopy is based on intense infrared laser. You guys all use little lasers in the lab today, uh, in the lab the last few days, including the little terrible uh, blue laser pointer that generate terrible optical spots. But those are cheap laser pointer, $300. We decided to buy it so that we can do the GRP experiment for mostly this cast. Um, but if you want to do multi-photon microscope like in my lab, you would be spending about maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars to buy a titanium sapphire laser that generates a light spot and would generate femtosecond pulses that I will explain in a little bit. But the basic idea of two-photon microscope is to have two infrared photons coming in at the same time and focus it both in space and time that I will explain a little bit more later such that you have a high flux of photon that it would cause simultaneous absorption of this infrared photon that would excite the molecule from the ground state to the excited state. And after excitation, everything is the same between one photon and two photon process. After excitation, the molecule would vibrational relax, emit a green photon, and then it is done. So what is the advantage of doing two photon excitation? One of the advantages of doing two-photon excitation is it is inherently three-dimensional. The basic idea is if you have, a, for example, if you have a UV light coming in focused by an objective, you see the light is uniform along the optical path. But if you have a lens sending in infrared light, the region of highest photon, infrared photon flux is at the focal point. And because two photon is a nonlinear process, you only generate two photon excitation, the simultaneous absorption of two red photons only at the focal point. So two photon excitation is a nonlinear process that gives you an inherent three-dimensional resolution. You only generate a teeny spot of light, or you generate a teeny spot of fluorescence using a Focus it in infrared light beam. Make sense so far? So, this is the experiment of sending infrared light in. You can see only a small green spot. So, before I go into a little bit detail, I also want to give you a little bit history of that. So actually, one might be a little bit surprised. Two-photon microscopy is relatively new, but the history stretched back to almost 1930s, which is an interesting, interesting history in the sense that in um, 1930s is the dawn of quantum mechanics. And at that time, Professor uh, Maria Gopermeyer was finishing her PhD thesis at that time. And she works with a number of actually very famous people, all these guys win Nobel Prize in physics at that time. Um, and she works on looking at the basic theory of quantum mechanics and asks whether it's possible for a molecule to absorb two photons at, at the same time. And as I showed you earlier, and I showed you some of the effect of two photon excitation, of course the answer is it is possible to excite two photons at a time. That was the prediction of Professor Maria Goppermeyer's thesis. And Professor Goppermeyer's name is always linked to two photon microscopy today by um, the so-called two photon cross section of a 404 the probability of a given 404, the efficiency of a given 404 excited by two photon process are measured in the Goppermeyer unit. So Professor Goppermeyer was always linked to two photon 
And one of the things that's interesting is, of course, that's not what Sue is famous for. Sue does her PhD thesis, and for most of us, after we graduated, we can't do something else different. And she actually do something much better. She kind of go into nuclear physics, and she win her Nobel Prize in the nucleic cell model on a completely different things. Uh, so she is mostly known for her work in nuclear physics because of the Nobel Prize, but for people that work on two photons like me, also know her very well for her work in her PhD thesis on predicting the fact that you can't do two photon. So that's also important. And actually, if you look at the chronology, you see that there's 1930s and the next step is 1960s. 1960 is the first experimental demonstration of two photon process. What, what happened in 1960s? I know some of you guys know. <laughs> what do you think? One of the things that you need for efficient two-photon excitation is you need a lot of light. Specifically, you need a lot of coherent light. So what that is means you need the invention of laser. So laser is, of course, another major invention. But I think this one does make quite a bit of money for some people, although there is a huge legal case associated with it. But around 1960s, there is a number of experiments that show that Two photon excitation or related process are possible and experimentally demonstrated it. But no one really used the process for very much of anything until about 1978. Um, my friend Colin Shepard, he was in Singapore a few months ago, uh, working with me and Dipan and a number of people. And, but now he moved to Italy. Um, I think he's also enjoying the Italian food in Italy at the moment. Um, so. Um, Dr. Shepard at that time started thinking about how to do, he actually, Dr. Shepard is another important figure in confocal microscopy. So he started thinking actually at that time also about what other method that he can use to do 3D imaging. So one of the things that he have done is build a micro, uh, one of the first second harmonic generation microscope that allow him to map, to image, crystal structures in 3D. He tried to use it on biological specimen, but there wasn't good enough laser at that time to do that. So the use of biological multi-photon imaging didn't happen until almost 1990s, when Dr. Winfred Dang and Dr. Ward Webb in Cornell University, with the invention of titanium sapphire laser and other femtosecond laser sources, uh, demonstrated the first two photon imaging in 3D of biological specimen. Very importantly, this paper was published in Science and in some way catch the attention of almost everybody, including my PhD advisor, uh, PhD postdoc advisor at the time, and say, Peter, why don't you go to Webb's lab and learn how to do two photon? I say, sounds like a good idea. And I think that in the long run, it is a good idea. <laughs> so anyway. So as I mentioned, what is good about multifocal microscopy? One of them is three-dimensional imaging. The second one is this. You may not recognize this guy. This is a protozoa. It is a euglena. It is doing a, this is just a white light microscope. Soon I'm going to turn on the UV lamp. Turn off the white light, turn on the UV lamp. Euglena fluorescence fluoresce red because it has um, uh, chlorophyll inside. But you can see the euglena start not to move so well. And in fact, the euglena start becoming wrong. Most cell wronging is in generally bad. And also the movement almost ceases. This everything is in real time. And if you turn the light back on, euglena is, I would say, dead at this point. Um, so all this are real time. And you can see that one of the disadvantages of UV microscopy just using a normal mercury lamp is, it is quite damaging. And the reason that it's quite damaging is you are sending in high energy radiation throughout the organism, and that generates a lot of reactive oxygen species that create a lot of damage of proteins. And so, and that kills the, kills the urina. <laughs> On the other hand, if you do two-photon imaging of the urina, this is the one on the right. 
you can see the Uguina come by, bounce off the labors, swim off again. I, we imaged it about 30 Uguina and they don't die. So why is two photon better? The reason two photon is a little bit better is not because of the fact that within the excitation volume, there are still damage. When you generate fluorescence excitation, you always have the probability of um, generating reactive oxygen species. The reason that you have less damage is because the excitation volume is very small. It's on the order of about 0.1 femtoliter, so that the amount of reactive oxygen species generation is much less. So that's why, in general, when you're imaging a fixed specimen in 3D, two photon in general is a better method in terms of limiting damage. So the third thing that are very simple idea, but also very important, is two photon today is one of the methods that allow you to image the deepest. Today, the champion of deepest imaging is Dr. Chris Su in uh, Cornell. So Dr. Su today have been able to image capillary in the brain down to about 1.5 millimeter. So think about your, sp your spiral. Your spiral is about 100 microns. And of course, you have no resolution, but it's very hard to see through it. But think about imaging through the living brain, looking at the capillary down one and a half millimeter, which is quite impressive, really. So the reason that two photon can go deep are two reasons. Number one is you are used, in order to generate fluorescence, typically you are using blue light or UV light. But in this case, you are using infrared. And infrared has less absorption in tissues. So this is wavelength. This is about 700 to 1,000 nanometer, which is the infrared wavelength region. This is about 500 nanometer, the visible light region. This is far infrared. And if you go down to the UV range, you see that there is a very strong tissue absorption by proteins and water. If you go to the long wavelength region, the far infrared region, you see that the, oops, you see that the water absorption is quite strong. Yeah, you see the water absorption is quite strong, but if you look at the middle here, you see the absorption goes down. This is what the optical guys call the optical window, between about 700 to about 1.2 microns. Within that range, the absorption is fairly low, and you can actually send light through tissue reasonably well. Not perfectly, but reasonably well. A second reason that you can go deeper is if you take a look at a glass of milk, why is the glass of milk white? Anyone know why is the glass of milk white? Because of scattering. Because the milk has a lot of milk solid and proteins, mostly casein. When you send the light in, these clusters of protein bounce the light around because they have the similar size at the optical wavelength. And because of that, light doesn't propagate in a coherent fashion through a scattering medium, unless you are Sahid that do something like so-called turbidity suppression. But on the other hand, in most cases, the light doesn't propagate through a turbid medium very well. And as it turns out, the amount of light scattering by scatterers is depends on wavelength. Typically, it goes one over the wavelength. So longer wavelength, you have less scattering. In fact, that's why the sky is blue. If you look at the, and also why the, uh, <clears throat> so if you go to longer wavelength, you have less scattering, and in general, you can go deeper. And so that's one of the advantage of two photon microscope. I don't want to go into detail here. Uh, I don't know whether I think that, um, Steve tell you a little bit about optical resolution, but if you take a look at a two photon spot or a confocal spot, typically it has a lateral size dependence goes as one over the NA. So the lateral resolution, so lateral, I don't mean the size, the lateral resolution, which is one over the size, goes as a numerical aperture. So for example, you guys was using a 40 times length, I think, 
0 0.75, 0 0.7, NA or so. So you can calculate what type of resolution that you have. But one thing that I want to point out is your axial resolution of all this method typically goes as 1 over NA squared. Um, which is, of course, one of the reasons that why uh, the Panjian's method is good because it kind of get around that, and the Dipan will tell you a little bit later. But in this particular, in most of these cases, typically, if you go to a low numerical aperture length, your axial resolution degrades much faster than your lateral resolution. And in general, the spot, if you look at how it distributes, it goes as some function that rings with a peak. I won't go into detail of that because you guys don't need to know that. So, I think I have a few more minutes. I will, I will only point out a few, for, actually, maybe I won't go into great detail because you guys are, most of you guys are going to see a two-photon microscope. In the, to make a good two-photon microscope, there are a few things you need. One of them is you need your $200,000 laser could generate femtosecond pulses of light. Everyone know what is a femtosecond? It's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. If you think a little bit about it, it's quite impressive. Actually, it's a very, very, very short time. And the reason you need that is you want all the photons not only concentrate in space by the objective, but also confined it in time so that you can have efficient high photon flux for efficient nonlinear excitation. Also, one of the things that you'll find that you will need is a scanner, an XY scanner. Um, you have a spot of light. A spot of light doesn't generate an image unless you move the spe specimen or you move the spot of light. You need to move the spot of light around relative to the specimen. Moving the specimen is harder than moving light because light is Lightweight specimen is finite weight, so it's faster to scan light than the specimen. So we typically have an XY scanner, and typically we also have good microscopes. Um, good microscopes are important, uh, but well, I guess you guys' microscope is probably about maybe a thousand dollars worth of microscope. Uh, so if you guys go back to your own lab. A microscope that you buy from almost with without fluorescence is probably a, maybe for thirty thousand dollars from a, from size of Olympus, and then if you put in all the bells and whistle for a normal fluorescence microscope would be sixty thousand dollars. I think as explained by a number of people, uh, one of the things that are critical for a good microscope is a good objective, and which is very hard to build really nice objectives. So in some way when you buy a microscope for $60,000 from the microscope company, you are really buying a very nice objective. The one that we give you guys, uh, not, not that good. <laughs> okay. So, you guys will see the two-photon microscope, but I just want to show you some movies of what you can see with a two-photon system. This is some work in collaboration with uh, Dr. Irinko Schiffer in Mass General Hospital. We are imaging a mouse ear. It's a dead mouse, but uh, we don't really have to kill it, but uh, it's easier to handle a dead mouse than a live mouse. Uh, also, you don't need a... Uh, uh, any more approval to image are already dead mouse. <laughs> so uh, that's why we do it. But we actually, I will show you some live mouse imaging. So we are looking at the skin again. So remember the skin with confocal doesn't look too great. But this is the skin of the mouse. And I'm going to show you layer by layer what you could see. This is completely endogenous signal. It's based on the fluorescence of the endogenous proteins in the cell. And you can see individual cells now, they are the keratinocytes. When you go a little bit deeper, you can see the uh, dermal layer, you can see the collagen, the elastin fibers. And then the mouse ear is similar to our ear. After the skin is cartilages. And the, and the honeycomb shaped structure are the cartilage in the mouse ear. So now we're coming back up again. You can see the, oh, actually, you rotate it around just for the fun of it. And then coming back up, you see the cartilage, see the collagen elastin fiber, the um, basal cells, keratinocyte surfaces, and that works pretty well. And 
you can image your mouse. You can also go to your friend, Dr. Barry Master, or Dr. Barry Master can come to you and say, can, would you like to do a paper and image my arm? And so you can see mouse skin between human and mouse and man are about, roughly about the same. Um, OK, so last image, so that I don't take up the pun's time, is if you take a look at what you can image with endogenous signal, that works pretty well. But I should point out that if, uh, if endogenous signal works very well, if you express GFP and put in exogenous signals, you can certainly do better. So this is something that we do very routinely today. You, many of you guys would be in Ali's lab um, this, uh, this afternoon or tomorrow. We image through the head of the mouse by putting a window on the skull, actually two windows on the skull, and that allow us to image into the brain and looking at GRP expressing neurons. So, so this is the imaging of going into the brain of, of, of the mouse. You can see that we are tracing the the dendrite from the surface of the brain down to the neuron body now going through the neuron body. And that's about on the order about maybe 200 to 300 microns. So you can go through and trace the structure of the neuron in 3D. And one of the things that we could do is we can look at the same neuron from the mouse over a period of time and track whether how does the neuronal structure change as a function of stimulus. We are interested in memory plasticity in the brain and asking how does stimuli affect the neuronal structure in 3D. As you can see, you can track the structure quite well. So I think that I should stop. And then um, I think I might give, uh, maybe take a few questions if there is any. If not, I will pass it to Dipan. Yeah, question. Do you need fluorescence for 2D? Also, do you need fluorescent tagging? Favorite? For 2D? Um, for photons? You, depends on what you want to see, right? For if tissue, you, how do you fluorescent? Uh, what do you want to see? Say that tissues. Again. Tissues. Um, depends on, also depends on what portion of tissue you want to see. If you want to see muscles, for example, you can actually see muscle structure very well based on so-called second harmonic generation. I don't have, I, as I kind of thought, I put it in the title, but I always, as I say, too archivistic, can't really go through that much. Um, so um, second harmonic generation can be seen from muscle structures, and you can image muscle structure. And as I show you in the skin, in the dermis, collagen also give you a very nice signal. Um, you can see the individual cells specifically. You see the cytosol of the cell and the mitochondria because you are mostly seeing NADH. You can, and of course, every cell have NADH, so you can see the cytosol of the cell. You can see the nucleus because it doesn't have very much NADH, so you have a negative contrast. So there are ways to do non-labeling fluorescence imaging of tissue. Doesn't matter whether you are 2D or 3D. Um, it really depends on what are the endogenous floral for that might be present. But I think that, uh, I mean, there are many other uh, optical imaging modality that we don't have time to go through, but fluorescence is only one of them. You can do other vibonic spectroscopy, such as Raman, Raman spectroscopy, Raman microscopy imaging to look at different things. Um, uh, so it gives you different contrasts. And, but I think that the, I should point out that string, the strength of fluorescence is the availability of today properly 10,000 different fluorophores that are available with specific tacking to many, many of the proteins. Um, that is because of the development of biochemists over the last 50 years that it has a big arsenal. Pretty much any, almost any biological molecule you want to see, there is a tag, fluorescence tag. And, and, and that is really due to the, the uh, biochemistry. Any other questions? If not, I think you guys can hunt me down for other questions later, and I will pass it to Devan.
Hi. So um, uh, I'll be talking about uh, my work on uh, development of uh, digital scan laser shield microscope and implementing uh, structural illumination for um, understanding tissue mechanics in uh, live um, uh, animal model system. So um, uh, if you, um, in, in the last uh, one, one and a half week of course, you, have, you know that like cell size, uh, shape, cell addition, protein localization, these things are very important. And these are related to stem cell plasticity, cellular differentiation, cell migration, apoptosis. And ultimately, these are connected to development and immune system and signaling pathways. So these all things are very interconnected. And ultimately, if you have to understand in um, how these things are uh, happening in developmental context, it is better to see in the real uh, animal model system in real time how these processes are happening. To do, uh, do those uh, these things, um, I am imaging, uh, using a 3D fluorescent imaging approach where I can see um, these um, development processes in real time in 3D and in uh, keeping uh, embryos or fish anesthetized in the, on the microscope for a really long time, several uh, hours to even days. And then we can get quantitative information uh, by image processing segmentation and track those cells, individual cells. And uh, ultimately, we can get the fundamental uh, ideas about the mechanism of development and uh, tissue uh, mechanism. To uh, see these processes, uh, if you see in the length scale of bi in uh, biology, to see the length scale in biology, uh, uh, so we, we want to see the tissue, so we need millimeter or uh, more uh, areas. But we want to see in single cell resolution. Then only we can uh, do the, the quantitative biologies like um, uh, cell shape, size, and localization of this kind of thing. So we need a really larger length scale, like uh, of the order of micron to millimeter length scale uh, in, uh, with a single cell resolution. And also, because we want to track those cells, we uh, uh, want to see in uh, the really large 3D stack of millimeter length scale in terms of several uh, seconds to even uh, of the order of days. So which is very challenging with the uh, present day technique like confocal and uh, spinning disk and other because with, uh, uh, if many of uh, you are using this kind of technique, you know like if you take thousands of layers uh, of uh, image in one or two type of scan, you bleach out all the fluorescent. So you would, can't image this kind of long, larger time continuously. So uh, there is a basic difference between confocal based technique to the technique I am using in laser sheet. Because in confocal, uh, if you are to image this kind of larger this is MDO, um, so, so, so you are using the same exci uh, objective for excitation and emission. And uh, in that particular plane by uh, focusing it like that. And also the fluorescent you are collecting. Uh, so, uh, through the same objective in this direction. So now you scan the point and you go point by point, you scan the whole thing and ultimately you photo bleach not only this plane, you photo bleach the whole area. So it is contributing all the planes uh, uh, by photo bleaching and also emission is also uh, coming from all the planes. Although using a tricky uh, thing, you are using a pinhole to select, uh, see, visualize only a thin part, but ultimately you are photo bleaching all the plane, particularly once you are seeing larger section of the tissue. But in the, uh, the microscope I am using, uh, I am using a separate objective from the side uh, with, uh, to image a sim similar sample, creating a laser sheet in the plane, a thin la la laser sheet uh, using proper combination of um, excitation objective and the scanner. And we collect the emission only from this plane on the detector. So, the, um, so you can clearly understand all, uh, once I am taking the image of a plane, I am only imaging that plane. I am not um, exposing the other plane to the laser. So photo bleaching reduces very dramatically, particularly for these uh, kind of thick and large tissues. So this is a, a microscope where we are using the laser. There is a AOTF where I can um, uh, modulate the power and select wavelength. Using the scanner and this objective combination, we can create a laser sheet in the uh, focal plane of the collection objective and the whole plane is imaged in this direction. So uh, as Peter mentioned, in confocal microscopy, the issue is um, in z direction, um, point spread function is very spread, particularly for if you want to see um, thick tissue and a higher depth, you have to go for high working distance objective. So these things get very uh, much worse. 
So um, uh, it is very much spread and that's why your Z resolution reduces dramatically. Whereas in this case, we are using from the side a uh, beam like uh, this much narrower. Though your detection point spread function is much um, elongated, but your effective point spread function of the system is uh, much shortened. So you, you uh, improve the Z resolution. And this is the same kind of bit using this kind of low NA objective. Uh, you can see the difference, um, how it becomes prominent in XZ resolution. And you can see also in, um, like a, this is the bead of 25 micron, in X, Y, and Z is very symmetric, uh, which you, uh, you actually the, it should be. So, if you uh, see the advantage of this technique, so over confocal, so one thing is uh, for this kind of larger sample, because I can uh, image a whole plane at a time, so it can go as fast as the camera can go, so of the order of few tenths of milliseconds, I can capture a frame. Where in confocal, it will take uh, this kind of larger frame, it will take of the order of tens of seconds. Photo bleaching is definitely one of the big issues I told already. The X, X, Y resolution of this uh, one is uh, kind of uh, compared and um, for low NA objective, uh, particularly if you want to, want to see the higher working distance, this one has um, little advantage over uh, confocal. XZ is always better. The detection sensitivity wise, uh, this one is using a um, um, camera cool, um, and so it, it has a, a higher quantum efficiency and it has a um, depth is better than confocal and um, also um, it has a photo bleaching what issue I already told and also thing is here in um, uh, my case I can rotate the sample so with X, Y, Z I can also take the three, uh, theta image. So I, um, I basically you can do tomography kind of uh, imaging information. So uh, to see this thing, what is the in vivo uh, mechanism of cell migration? So we can mount say uh, fish anesthetized and uh, in embedded in agar in the um, collection plane of the objective or you can do a, even embryo and you can take layer by layer uh, fluorescent imaging on this system. So this is the, uh, one of the projects I am uh, doing um, on uh, understanding biomechanics of uh, embryogenesis. You can see this kind of embryogenesis uh, also Roger showed yesterday. But one of the issues of this uh, kind of uh, non-fluorescent imaging is you don't have resolution of which cells goes where. And uh, last week also uh, Ray Keller told that um, uh, what uh, some of the uh, things, it took him 15 years to convince people which cells goes in which direction. But Ideally, this kind of imaging method, you can really see where each of the cells are going. So you can see one of the movie of the embryo development. These are single cell labeled with histone GFP. And it formed the blastulation, blastulation, and it formed the neuronal uh, tube. You can see the eye formation in this part. This is the eye socket formation. And this is the neuronal tube formation. So this thing you can see in, with single cell resolution, whole processes. Similarly, you can uh, take uh, another view on the other side. You can see all the single cells. These are uh, moving. It forms the blastulation, gastulation, and then it is forming the neuronal tube in this part. And this imaging is like around 600 to 700 image stack and continuously image for around 12, 14 hours. So, uh, so we can uh, uh, do also the quantitative um, biology, what I told, you can track those cells, you can uh, find the coordinate of each of the things, and you can um, see the tissue radiology of uh, how each of the cell uh, move, moving in a coordinated manner. So, uh, even in the later stage, we can see the somite structure, in, it is a jet stack, you can see uh, in, the, in the spine, individual somites, the, uh, with two color imaging, uh, red is uh, with um, histone, and uh, green is membrane tagged. So uh, although in the later stage you can't uh, um, see individual, um, once you see the whole projected view, but in each of the plane you can understand individual cell localization and how their sh shape is in different area of the uh, tissue. Similarly, we can uh, go in um, from this point, once we go in the later stage, we can uh, 
uh, you can see here the muscle tissue formation after um, around 12 hours. It is, it is uh, whole imaging is happening on the microscope continuously, and each of the time point you can see the how the tissue uh, degeneration is taking place. So basically, you can see this kind of structure, and after 12 hours continuously imaging, you can see how the muscle formations are happening. So this is one of the movie where you can see the this kind of later part of the neurulation happens. So another big issue about any imaging method is how viable the system is because um, um, you are exposing laser and continuously keeping it anesthetized and on the microscope how uh, whether it is development is happening properly. So you can see in this case uh, that this embryo was imaged from very earlier time and in the later part heart is formed so it is going to be you can see the heartbeat continuously. This is the eye socket, this is spine and the bottom part in a close scan you can see the heart beating continuously. So it, it is going for the development properly and in proper time. So uh, though you are exposing with laser, uh, these are not um, having so much photo damage and phototoxic effect. So in another collaboration with um, Christoph Winkler's group, um, uh, what we wanted to see on the um, um, live fish, in the particular in the spine area, how um, the um, uh, localization of osteoclast cells um, happen. So uh, which is the, uh, the question was which is the birthplace of the osteoclast cells on the spine? How do they localize? And um, RNKL, this, uh, the wrinkle, uh, induced this osteoclast differentiation factor, how they uh, induce and activate the, um, this process. So you can see, um, in this, this is in the um, larval fish. You can see the spine structure and green uh, are the um, osteoclast cells. You can uh, do segmentation and also you can go in different uh, portion of it. You can go inside and see which, which part, which, what are the cells are localized. It is a, in, a, in the spine structure you can clearly understand. And also in a long time lapse you can see the, how, how the dynamics, local dynamics of the osteoclast cells on the spine. keeping the fish uh, alive and size. So another issue is uh, imaging this kind of fish layer by layer. So uh, we can see, uh, though although we can image the thing, this is the intestine, this is going into the outer layer, you can see the blood flows. So this is some of the blood cells flowing. Now you can go to the outer layer, you can see the individual um, cells on the skin. But some of the portion of the tissue, ultimately it is, as it is tissue imaging, uh, some of the portion of the tissue, it gives high amount of scattering. Suppose these, these are the areas. So uh, this method is not out of, uh, it's not solving all the questions. So there are also uh, chance of development of, for that uh, side. So um, I will come to that part. Before that, I want to show also uh, the, in this uh, method, it is not only applicable for um, uh, this animal model. I also tried some of the experiment with the um, uh, cell in culture in 3D culture. There also you can see the individual cells in culture, and you can see uh, yeah, it is a um, uh, cytoplasmic marker. You can see the individual uh, cells in culture. So uh, before that, uh, what I was telling that. Uh, the background haze is also a, a big issue and also because of the high scattering and um, still this one, these techniques are limited to laser penetration. Um, it can't go uh, because laser can't penetrate some, more than certain depth in a, a, depending on tissue type. And uh, also it has a laser shadowing effect. You might have noticed in a few of the images. And um, so also it, it is very much dependent on sample mount because two objectives has to come very close. So your whole machining and geometry is very important. And second thing is, uh, which is the, I think is big issue is in this kind of case, because once I'm taking this kind of images, it goes really large image. So these are easily one overnight exponent, like 600, 700 gig data. So this amount of data handling, image processing and segmentation 
So you have to do a lot of uh, data handling and um, uh, kind of automation in, in terms of uh, getting some quantitative information out. So to uh, check the background haze, we uh, implemented in the earlier method one m small modification. We introduced the structural illumination into it. This part is done uh, in collaboration with uh, Vijay from Peter Sow's group and Chenzi uh, from George's group, and of course with Peter, uh, several discussion. And um, so, co uh, compared to the earlier method, when I, from the side I scanned, I made the laser sheet. What I am doing is I am doing very fast modulation of the laser during the scan. So it is like I am uh, scanning from top to bottom in one case like that. Another case I am doing off on, off on kind of top to bottom. So you can imprint a pattern on your uh, sample like that. And you can also synchronize the scanning of the um, scanner, the, um, also the power modulation and also camera such that same pattern is imprinted on all the plane. So in the same way we can See, like a, in a uh, in a fish structure, you can you can have the grid pattern imprinted on it. So this is kind of structural illumination, and using this kind of uh, structural illumination, you can get uh, get rid of this kind of background is quite dramatically. So two of the method uh, we are, we have used here. I won't go into the much technical details, but if anyone is interested, you can talk later. So one is three phase method where you are taking three images, image 1, image 2, and image 3, in three different phases, 0, 120, and 240 degree. So you are having all the three images. And from these three images, you can uh, do the calculation, and you can get image which, is, uh, which has much background reduction. Another method is called high-low method, which is working, um, in our case, much better. So rather than taking three images, we can take two images. One is um, structured image, and one of this plane image. And as you know, once you see through objective, any object which is in focus has uh, it has a um, uh, um, high frequency information. So you can uh, take the high frequency information from uh, your um, unstructured image, and uh, any object which is spread all over, you are taking the low frequency of information from this thing out. So if something, this uh, low frequency information is coming from um, scattering and background haze, you can remove those things. So now combining those two images, you can get an image which is called high-low image and which um, is supposed to be uh, much better than the normal image. Now if you see the thing for um, this effect because dramatical once uh, you are having the membrane kind of structure, you can um, uh, high load uh, does quite well in um, particularly in the higher depth and you can see the um, structure all, you can remove the background uh, and we can get the structure back without losing the structures so this is one of the image of the fish this is um, the eye socket this is the spine this is the raw data once you do the um, uh, three phase processing you can get rid of background but in the higher depth it doesn't work so good but in high low, it even uh, works better. So from this image, you can get much uh, better image without background reduction. And ultimately, you can uh, see the structure in 3D, and it is having much uh, background reduction. And it, it can these are the really high depth, like around 500, 600 micron. These are the histone EGFP tag, so you can see individual cells. So uh, one thing hot I will be uh, I was telling you here very important parameter here is the sample mounting and sample preparation because um, here um, uh, whole geometry is very complicated um, because it is two object has to come very close and how to uh, put your sample and align it so um, uh, also as we want to take this kind of high data uh, input so we are need a very uh, fast readout and we have put a hard, um, radar a disk got a parallel of eight hard disks to write the data from the thing and which I can go up to one gig per second writing speed and um, so uh, because if you have to image those kind of development process for a very long time 
So it is uh, very important to have a suitable uh, incubation system, cell and anesthetize um, condition such that cell or fish they are in good condition. And um, second thing is um, we want to take these kind of 3D uh, images with, with or without structure if you want to do structural illumination and which easily go in, in terms of several hundreds of gig data. And then to do this kind of image processing and segmentation, you need a lot of automation. So you, you have to do a lot of automation and segmentation, and ultimately uh, you are getting the fi final image processing. So um, uh, this is the conclusion. Uh, implemented, um, we implemented the um, high low based structured illumination into DSLM. And um, we're working on uh, using this technique for, for biological application right now. And we, uh, we can image uh, tissue migration in real time with single sen uh, sensitivity. And you can track them by image processing. We could image fish up to six to seven hours with anesthesia. It worked. And uh, contrast imaging, depending on the tissue type, you can also go up to millimeter depth, particularly for MDO site, where it more transparent. And uh, with um, 100 to uh, 1,000 um, jet, uh, jet stack, depending on um, this, because we are, uh, photo bleaching is very less, and for several hours. And so without significant photo bleaching is a big issue in this kind of case, advantage, big advantage in this kind of case. And uh, for this kind of um, imaging can be generate a lot of data, and ultimately one has to do the data in its processing and segmentation to get information out. Now, question. So, in your images, what's the view of you that you are able to? Okay, okay, these images, um, are you, uh, okay, I'm just going back probably. I've used different kind of objective, but um, suppose the, all the embryo images, uh, because I need a really large field of view. And I used, uh, this one is taken in 10x, uh, 0.3 NA water immersion objective. It is not very high NA objective. It is 0.3 NA water immersion objective. Suppose, this one, suppose these are the images. So here it is around 980 micron by um, 780 micron. And depth is around, um, it was, this one is around uh, 500 micron in this case. Yeah. It is 10x uh, 0.3 numerical aperture Zeiss uh, water immersion objective images. But today you can buy objective without similar fuel size with high NA, but this yeah. costs a lot more money. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, actually, uh, 10x uh, high NA is difficult. It's 20x there are high NAs, but 10x there is, I have not seen any. Uh, but still about one millimeter fuel size. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, what is the focal parameter of your illumination? How, how much does it diverge you know, along, yeah. The, yeah. along the axial direction? So, the uh, yeah, the, this is one of the things. Uh, yeah, so uh, there are, um, so in the middle part, it is around uh, 3 micron kind of thickness, I can go, mm -hmm. and depending on. Actually, I have some of the objective which I can even narrow it or narrow down. But thing is, then sides are much wide because as you focus it, particularly if you are, uh, if uh, as I was uh, interested to see that large field of view, I was taking where I compromise in the uh, width, but uh, side is around five micron, five to three micron is the uh, spread. But um, uh, if if some particular application, if uh, someone want to go for a very small field of view, you can take an objective, like a, I think a similar objective is there like a, a close to one NA. So where uh, the divergence is uh, very strong, but your field is very small and almost uniform that part. So um, uh, another thing I wanted to say in this kind of application, uh, presently uh, some of the people are uh, using um, basal beam with a multi-photon. Uh, so we can have a much uh, narrower and longer field of view. But uh, okay, ultimately we have to build on a based on multi-photon and which cost us a lot of money. Yeah, using Axicon or this kind of technique, people have uh, already used it um, with uh, creating basal beam. And you can have a really large field of view. And, and also, 
on the on the detection side you don't have to scan your objective for the no detection side it is just a flat image of the whole thing because you were illuminating only one plane the whole plane you were imaging about. but to go from one plane to another plane so i am moving the sample yeah, I have to, uh, every between the step, I'm moving the sample, one micro step. Well, I guess if there's no more questions, I guess we will break, take a break for the, from the instrumentation section, and then I guess we have one more talk this, this morning, and then you guys go back to the rotation. <laughs> <laughs>